To keep yourself updated, subscribe to Indigo Learn and click the bell icon and download our app OneFin to start learning on the go. There is this company which is a large uh, fertilizer company which is where one of the companies where I was working with and you know this company towards the end of the year had a huge amount of receivables. The reason why they had the receivables was because you know fertilizer companies follow the Indian agriculture pattern of you know Rabi and Kharif. Kharif is the season which is around May, June, July and Rabi is the November, December, Jan season right whereas the financial year ending is in March. So, you know, whatever Rabi sales used to happen in Jan, typically the money out of that would come back only, you know, May, June, thereabouts, not uh, before that. So, what would happen was for our company and for a lot of other fertilizer companies per se, they used to have good amount of receivables towards the year end. And these receivables, whatever, you know, it used to run to thousands of crores and in order to finance those receivables, what the companies used to do was, they used to take some kind of uh, borrowings from banks. So, if the entire working capital finance concept what you have discussed in FM right where uh, you know the net working capital gap whatever is available based on that you actually go and get bank finance. So, uh, my company like many other fertilizer companies used to show that as a you know working capital drawing power they used to have these working capital limits with a lot of banks and based on that they used to compute a drawing power and they used to borrow loans against the drawing power in order to finance this receivables. So, what does this mean just to put it much more simply. I have sold something, so basically I have purchased some raw materials, to, so I am basically due to the vendor, right, due to the supplier. Now that raw material what I have purchased, I have manufactured the product and then I have also sold the product, but the money has not yet come back to me, right. So I am now due to my supplier and I am also due to the entire chain, my factory overheads, office expenses, staff, marketing, you know, salaries of HR, so bunch of these expenses. So all these expenses right from procurement stage till eventual end sale stage, all all these expenses are yet to be paid or will be paid they are supposed to be met out of the sale proceeds right but once I have made the sale the money is not yet come back. So what would happen is last three or four months of period whatever sale used to happen used to accumulate uh, in form of receivables and the money would not be received. To some extent they would take you know borrowings against this kind of uh, receivables where they would say you know this is my receivables and you know I will probably get some kind of this money will come back and they will show some history of uh, you know last two years three years when you know the people used to pay on time and all of that and then they would uh, take the borrowing from the various working capital bankers that the company would have. But there was another alternative. Uh, what used to happen is this entire receivables because there is a receivable here and then there is a borrowing here. So if you look at the balance sheet right on the balance sheet on the asset side you have huge receivables and on the liability side you have a borrowing right. Technically you had received money you would have taken the money from the receivables and paid off the borrowings right. That is how the entire working capital cycle is right. You once you make the sale you get the money and either you pay off the vendors or you pay off the big lender from whom you have borrowed. So you have borrowed from a bank and paid all your vendors right. All these expenses which we discussed earlier your suppliers, manufacturing costs, factory overheads, rent, salaries all of that. So you had borrowed from the bank and met all these expenses. Now that amount is lying as a liability in your balance sheet. If, if the sale money proceeds had come quickly, you would have paid off the entire either directly these people or if you have taken the loan from the bank, you would repay the bank, right. But because that has not happened on both sides of the balance sheet, you actually have some big huge numbers, you know, 1000 crores, 1500 crores, huge numbers, right. So this used to unnecessarily, what it used to do was, it used to balloon the balance sheet size, that was one. Second thing what used to happen was, a lot of people you know let us say investors or people who are analyzing your company analysts a bunch of them used to actually look at these receivables and they used to get perturbed even though it was a seasonal business even though it has been happening for a period of time people are like why do you have so much receivables are these realizable is there any problem in the business even after explaining that it is a seasonal business it is an agri business and a lot of that they still used to be you know very uncomfortable around a large receivables number same way they also used to be uncomfortable around large loans even though these were working capital loans and these were earmarked against this receivables they used to feel very very uncomfortable right. So all your ratios like debt to equity ratio and other ratios current assets current liabilities ratio all of them used to be actually looking very very weird right even though there were cases where we used to say you know don't look at total debt look at only long term debt this is all working capital debt but still it would never cut ties with a lot of uh, investors. So what we ended up doing was we started securitizing these receivables. Right. So what is securitizing these receivables? We have a bunch of dealers to whom we have sold from whom we expect the money in the next two to three months. 
right so what we would do is we would take these entire receivables of my fertilizer uh, sales and we used to create a package of let us say 100 crore receivable 200 crore receivables right and it used to be split based on the fertilizer dealer and even in dealer we used to give invoice details and all of that and then make it a 100 crores 200 crore bunch right and then what we would say is we would approach banks right now there are one bankers from whom we have taken loans right keep that aside now we would also approach another set of banks who are interested it could be banks it could be nbfc it could be anyone right typically it is more often than not it is banks and nbfcs who are interested in this kind of a game or in this kind of a practice so we would approach banks or nbfcs and we would say look here i have a pool of receivables i have a pool of debtors who you know have history of payment who have you know always paid on time and because of you know whatever seasonal nature that we have uh, you know there's a huge amount lying on our balance sheet and we want to actually securitize securitize means create a security out of it security means not a uh, you know security guard security means a stock bond share security a security as per security contract regulation act is there no a security as defined as per that right so that is a kind of a security which is traded in the market here we are creating some kind of a financial instrument or a financial asset that can be monetized that is what is meant by security right we are this entire 300 crores or 200 crores whichever is there as receivables used to be converted into let's say a piece of paper right which we call a security it's a financial asset or a financial instrument and that piece of paper we used to sell to a bank right now when we sell to the bank there are multiple structure in in which you can securitize such kind of receivables one of the structures is basically you know sell them and take some money right so basically you sell 300 crores and then uh, 300 crores worth of receivables and the person who purchases it will not pay you 300 right because your receivable is 300 so assume that all your receivable guys will pay on time nobody will default assume all of that right assume that everything is good everything is fine all payments are going to happen well but when you sell him 300 crores, this entire NBFC or bank to whomever you are selling, you are getting 300 crores instantly. But this person is going to get 300 crores after 3 months or after 4 months or I don't know, whenever the next period happens, over a period of time, this person is going to get. So what this person would do is, I will not give you entire 300 crores. I will, let us say, assume a pattern of when the receivables will actually come in. I will assume that, you know, 100 crores will come in first month, 100 crores will come in second month, 100 crores will come in third month, something like that. I'll make an assumption and based on that assumption, I will actually plot the cash flows and we both will agree on a rate, right? Some kind of a interest rate, it a proxy for an interest rate or a discount rate. And I will discount these cash flows by that rate. And there is some amount that is uh, that is arrived at when you do all this discounting, you probably get let's say 250 crores or 280 crores, right? That 280 crores is what I will pay you. So what have they done? You have your entire pool of receivables. That receivables you've said instead of calling them so many dealer receivables, you combined all of them, you pooled them. Then you created a marketable security or an instrument, financial instrument, which is basically what is a security. That security you sold to somebody and then you got some money. What happened because of this? The, if you look at the balance sheet, right? On the receivable side, 300 crores is gone. On the liability side, when I got this 280 crores, what would I do? I will not keep cash idle, no? What is the use of getting keeping cash idle? So that 280 crores, we used to pay off our uh, bank borrowings. Then what happens? On your both asset side and liability side, balance sheet sizes decreased. And the 20 whatever is there, which is basically your discounting cost or you know you can call it interest or some kind of financial expenditure, that would obviously be apportioned over a period of time or it is charged off, whatever. Let us not get into the accounting aspect of it for now. We are in SFM, let us stick to SFM that would actually be you know charged out to PL over a period of time right now so that is how we would actually reduce the size of the balance sheet and that is how what we would do was also ensure that we got our money into the system based on the history of this entire pool of this you know 300 crores worth of dealer receivables right this is a very simple explanation i mean obviously there's a lot of documentation that went into it there's a lot of pricing issues that went into it there is a lot of credit guarantees or credit enhancements that went into it there's a lot of rating issues there's a lot of history of this dealer so a lot of that stuff went i've explained it to you saying 300 280 but when you negotiate Negotiate with a bank or an NBFC, it is not so simple. And they will want to check a lot of things, right? So all of that went to it. But I have simplified it for your understanding that this is the simple process. Now, this is one example, right? Now, let me give you another example. And this another example is with respect to basically personal loans. 
Now, this is in one of the sister companies of the organization where I was working. They are a large NBFC in India, right? So, they used to have few thousands of crores of uh, personal loans and gold loans, auto loans, and a bunch of them, right? And even, in fact, uh, truck loans, tractor loans, a bunch of uh, loans for uh, various such purposes. What they would do is, very similar situation, they would have lent money to a lot of tractor purchases. Right. For a lot of farmers across the country, there are tractor purchases, right? They are an NBFC, they would have lent money. Lent mother, the farmer has come and borrowed from them and they have given them money. Now, it is a 5-year loan, 10-year loan, right? Now, if they sit and wait, and it is this, assume that for a moment these are fixed rate loans, okay? Don't get into floating rate, fixed rate and all. Assume everything is fixed rate. It makes life very, very simple to understand, right? Assume that it is a fixed rate loan. Now, in this fixed rate loan, this kind of uh, whatever uh, tractor receivables that they have, what happened was, as an NBFC, right, what is the NBFCs and banks, what is their raw material? Their raw material is money, right? They're all called factories of credit, if you remember. Banking is factory of credit, right? Or banks are factories of credit, correct? So, these guys, they would actually lend this money to tractor uh, purchases like, you know, all your farmers. So, whatever money they had, they would have exhausted, right? But these receivables are there from EMI payments are supposed to be made by tractor guys. All the farmers had to pay them EMIs on a monthly basis, correct? That money would come to them, let's say 300 crores of tractor loans are there. That 300 crores of tractor loans, every month you would probably get half lakh crore, you know, 20 lakhs, 50 lakhs, 1 crore like that. Over a period of let's say 5 years or 10 years, they would get their money back. But in the interim period, by the time they get their money back, right, these guys did not have further money to actually lend to somebody. So, what they did was, they said, so we have a set of tractor loans, right. These tractor loans, what we will do is, we will create again, what we discussed in my fertilizer company case, right, same way. We will pull all the tractor loans together and we will create, there it is EMI, please note the distinction. When it was receivables, it is absolute receivable value. Uh, typically what happens is in most of the large organizations, you have two months credit, three months credit and people only if it exceeds beyond a period, they charge interest. But receivables usually do not carry interest. Whereas in case of a loan, tractor loan per se, right, the EMI portion, whatever the farmer pays to this NBFC, the EMI has both interest as well as principal. That is the distinction that you have to understand because uh, it is not really well brought out in the material, but that is a very, very fine distinction or rather it's a very obvious distinction if you ask me, which you should remember because there are a lot of things linked to this distinction, right? So when they had all the pooled, all these EMIs or future EMIs, not existing EMIs, future EMIs, whatever are payable and all of that stuff, fixed rate again. Right. They pulled all of this, they created a security or they created some one document, right? one piece of paper. They created a piece of paper and then they sold it to another bank. Now, same logic like what we did, right? In the case of fertilizer business, 300 crores, they created a security and sold it to a bank. And when they sold it to the bank, the bank probably gave them 280 crores, 250 crores, whatever money they got it, right? So now here one, in case of fertilizer company, it was receivables. In case of an NBFC, it was the uh, tractor receivables. It could be auto loans, it could be personal loans, it could be anything, any kind of loan, right? These are not for your, uh, you know, five day loan, 10 day loan, you know, 20 day loan. There are people who do such kind of loans also. But typically when you do these kind of securitization deals are done for receivables that are probably, you know, two months, three months, one year, two years, 10 years, stuff like that. So in both these cases, whether it is a fertilizer company or whether it's an NBFC, once I've created the security and sold it off to a third party, these receivables which are there, do they belong to me? No, I mean, I've already sold them, right? Whatever future cash flows from these receivables are there, I have created in the form of a paper and said, you know, you take it. So once I've sold that, I no longer own them. So all the risks and rewards, right? All the risks and rewards of these two receivables and tractor loan EMIs or whatever EMIs now belong to somebody else. Risks and rewards, please note that. Risks and rewards, right? Here, there is one very, very clear point that you guys have to understand. So, when all the risks and rewards belong to somebody, somebody can say, no, no, I don't want all the risks. I want the rewards or I want certain element of risks. I am willing to take risk like this much, beyond this you take or first small risk you take, beyond that I will, you know, more risk I will take. So it can be structured either way. So where the risk is not taken by this particular NBFC or bank who is buying these securities, such kind of transactions are called recourse transactions. That is, I don't want the risk. I have purchased the receivables from you. But if some receivables go bad or if some fellow EMI person, you know, is a bad debt, I don't want to bear the risk. When someone says that, that kind of a transaction is called recourse transaction. 
what happens in such case i who was the original party who to whom these receivables were due or emi was due i have to bear that risk so they have a recourse over me recourse means a way or a path so the eventual buyer of these securities has a recourse to me so those are called recourse transactions let us say someone says no no i will take all the risks i will price the risks into that 280 crores or 250 crores whatever the number is right because i am taking over all the risk it is not 280 it is 270 you will say okay fine but see don't get i will also explain the process of how do you price the risk at least briefly i will explain you know what are all the factors in pricing that risk but for a moment understand someone says i will take all risks and rewards right then that fellow will obviously include it in his pricing so he will say no no if normally the interest rate the discounting factor right so just go back to the definition what i gave the 300 crores is let us say supposed to come in 3 or 4 months period you will put it over 4 months and you will discount it by some number which is the interest rate and then you will say when i take an npv i am going to get 280 i am going to pay you 280 that is how you arrive at the price right now let's assume that interest rate is 12% that 12% will change depending on whether it is recourse or non recourse so it is a recourse basis that is he always can say any bad debt you only bear right then i will say then why do i need to pay you 12% please discount it by 10% please discount it by 9% if i discount by 9% what happens the npv increases so i actually get more money when i sell this asset when i sell this marketable security right whereas let us say all of them are poor quality receivables you know the quality is horrible some of them are may pay may not pay some of them are very have very bad history uh, very small percentage let us say 2% of them have bad history 2% of them have history of delayed payments or 2% of them probably don't have great civil score right based on that you know then he will say no no there is a, some problem with your thing Uh, with your portfolio i believe that you know probably there is some issue with the portfolio potentially hence it is not 10% it will be 14% so he will discount it by 14% and the cash flow series of cash flows what you have here when they are discounted by 14% you probably get 250 the 300 crores worth of receivables or emi or whatever it is when you are discounting it by higher rate you get a smaller number so that smaller number is paid off to me right so in that case when there is no recourse he will increase the discount rate and when there is recourse he will decrease the discount rate or the pricing it is very costly to do the deal if your quality of assets is bad it is very cheap to do the deal if your quality of assets is good or if you take the risk right if this nbfc guy is taking the risk he expects a high reward which is why he is getting a high interest rate if he is not taking the risk he'll get a low reward so he'll put a lower discount rate and hence he will have to pay a higher number to me right so this is the broad concept which you have to understand if you have understood this right this whole process of securitization where you know for an nbfc how it helps because once they have sold off these tractor loans or auto loans or credit card loans whatever it is they have money that money they can again lend to somebody right once you understand this concept for the purpose for which it is done by an nbfc or the purpose for which it was done by my fertilizer company where i was working you understood the essence of securitization